precision delivery of medicine. Entertainment franchise games absolutely exploding. Small modular reactors and the nuclear renaissance, plus AI moving into very complex workflows. Now these were just a few of the major tech innovations that partners at A16Z predicted last year. And our partners are back, and we just dropped our list of over 40 plus big ideas for 2024, a compilation of critical advancements across all our verticals, from smart energy grids to crime detecting computer vision, to democratizing miracle drugs like GLP-1s, or even AI moving from black box to clear box. You can find the full list of 40 plus builder worthy pursuits at a16z.com slash big ideas 2024 or you can click the link in our description below. But on deck today, you will hear directly from one of our partners as we dive even more deeply into their big idea. What's the why now? What opportunities and what challenges are on the horizon? And how can you get involved? Let's dive in. As a reminder, the content here is for informational purposes only. Should not be taken as legal, business, tax, or investment advice, or be used to evaluate any investment or security and is not directed at any investors or potential investors in any A16Z fund. Please note that A16Z and its affiliates may also maintain investments in the companies discussed in this podcast. For more details, including a link to our investments, please see a16z.com slash disclosures. Hey everyone, my name is Grant Gregory. I'm an investment partner on the American Dynamism team, and this is my big idea for 2024. A new age of maritime exploration. Generations ago, our ancestors took to the seas to explore, and yet today we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about our own planet seabed. A new age of maritime exploration is changing that, and founders are leading the way. Maritime faces similar reliability and engineering challenges as air and space, and many of the technologies pioneered by the latest space age can be ready applied here too. Meanwhile, the size and importance of the commercial and defense markets provide substantial reward. We're seeing companies like Flexport, Saronic, and Saildrone, and many others have already started modernizing maritime, and we anticipate that continued geopolitical supply chain and climate disruptions will further accelerate the demand for change here. Advances in AI, hardware, and computer vision present opportunities to transform our cities, ports, and trade networks with autonomous modernized ferries, container ships, and fishing fleets. Robots will help sustainably mine precious materials from the seafloor, map and survey waterways, and monitor the health of our ecosystems. New generations of naval and coast guard vessels, ships, and submarines will set out to protect our supply chains and our shores. Technology is once again returning to maritime. All right, Grant, you say that we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about our own planet seabed. This is kind of mind blowing if you really think about it because we're so close to the sea and it's so integrated into our industries like defense and the supply chain. So why is this? Why do we know more about Mars than our own seabed? Yeah, you know, it's it's a great question. I think on, on the surface, um, it seems kind of silly, but you know, when you think about the raw surface area here, it's quite massive. The ocean covers 70 plus percent of the earth Trade is somewhere north of 55% of global GDP, and over 80% of that by volume is getting transported on the sea. And so you're dealing with something that has, frankly, just substantial scale that we frankly don't have a lot of great line of sight into. If you think about it, when we can look up into the stars, there's plenty of light. If you're looking down into the water, you can only go so far before uh, it fades into black. And so as a result, historically, we've just had very little literal visibility into the ocean. And most of what we actually know about the ocean seafloor today has been gathered from gravity data from satellites. And so it's a useful starting point, but the resulting resolution that we have is only about two square miles, I think. Uh, and when you compare that to something like our maps of Mars or Venus, those are by comparison 50x more detailed. And so it's, it's pretty astounding. Um, yeah especially when you consider how important the ocean is for life. Ryan Peterson at Flexport has a great line that the oceans are the circulatory system for the world. Um, but fortunately, I think there's a lot of trends that are pointing in the direction of us actually understanding our oceans much more visibly. Totally. And I think you make a great point that it's literal darkness when you get 
not that deep and, and our oceans are pretty vast. But maybe you could share a little bit more about the reality of the maritime economy. So when we're talking about the ships or the logistics that we all rely on, what does that look like in 2023? And maybe you can also touch on why it feels like that's been largely untouched by some of the 21st century technology that we're seeing in other industries. I think the one important thing to call out is that maritime is a category that historically has been marked by pretty profound uh, innovation and changes. Um, just from a historical perspective, I mean, you started with something like the sailboat, which today is, is quite uh, de minimis, but at the time was very substantial. You created something like the sextant, the submarine, sonar even, mm -hmm. um, and then something like the shipping container that reduced global costs of transportation um, for goods by something like 99%. And so maritime in many ways has been the genesis of a lot of pieces of technology that have fundamentally changed the world and give us today. Um, but interestingly, a lot of the current state of the art is very analog. I and mean, we're talking about an industry that still operates largely with pen, paper, and maybe emails and phone calls. Really? Um, and I, th <laughs> I think part of that is just there's an inherent amount of friction in trying to make logistics work and work on time. Um, and as we've globalized, the margin for error has uh increase substantially and we're starting to see some additional other pressures uh, in the past few years in a number of, of ways. Yeah, so maybe we can talk to that. Why in 2024 does it seem like there's a true tipping point here to change that equation? The past three years, I think, are a good place to start, which is, you know, whether it's COVID, supply chain disruptions or geopolitical conflict and strife, I mean, all of these things are intimately connected to our oceans and global trade. And so as a result, we've seen some pretty significant dislocations uh, in the past number of years. I mean, during COVID, we had the ever given ship blocking the Suez Canal. We had the LA port congestion famously. We've seen a rise in piracy. Um, and then more recently, we had the Titan submarine implosion. Um, and I think they all point to the fact that um, you know, our, our supply chains are intimately connected, Maritime's at the heart of that, and the way of conducting things analog is not gonna work anymore. And so I think there's, there's that backdrop, which is important to understand. Uh, and then there's also some other like larger, I think deep currents here. Uh, one is the International Marine Organization has been establishing new rules and guidance for both emissions, energy usage, um, and then also just like broader visibility and data uh, maintenance. And so now ship owners have a real desire and need um, to figure out how to make their fleet more observable, reliant and performant. And then also you're seeing just a, a real rise on the DOD side with renewed interest in the South Pacific region. Um, and again, that's tied to observability, deterrence, resilience. Um, and a lot of these factors. And then I'd say like on the final part too, you know, encouragingly we're seeing a wave of startups that are entering more of a maturity stage. Flexport's a great example, and there's plenty of others um, that have kind of proven out this is a real market and there's real opportunity here to digitize it. And it's difficult, but it's possible. Uh, and equally we're seeing people from a lot of the other American dynamism companies like SpaceX, Tesla, and Andrel they're taking their learnings and experiences and bringing them over to the ocean. Right, and some of those companies like SpaceX are specifically in aerospace. So what are the innovations, whether it's in aerospace or otherwise, that we can actually borrow now that we're in 2023, heading into 2024, what can be kind of copy and pasted or evolved as we look to maritime? There's a lot. I'd, I'd say like there's a great, a great way to delineate it would be there's the processes and understanding how to build quickly and scalably. And then there's the actual technology. And if you're to take an overly simplistic lens to all of this, you know, space and, and the ocean are both very unforgiving environments. Yep. If you have a hole in your rocket, it's going to explode. And if you have a hole in your boat, it's going to sink. And so the status quo here is that there's you know unrelenting physical forces that are acting adversarially against anything that you're creating and then putting into that environment. And so that creates a dynamic where everything that you're building from an engineering perspective has to be both resilient, um, hardened, and also needs to be incredibly performant in a whole range of scenarios. 
Uh, and then the water also is just like a, a very difficult environment if you think about it. I mean, electronics and water don't mix well at all. No. <laughs> um, there's limited sensing capabilities. A lot of the sensors that we use in other categories like radar and LIDAR, GPS, they don't really work on the water and they definitely don't work underwater. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also you're just dealing with an environment where everything's moving. Um, you have wind, you have waves, you have currents, tides, boats, uh, and then wildlife. And so all of this needs to be hardened. Uh, and, I, and I think actually a good example of some of the advances you can see on whether it's machine vision, robotics, autonomy, um, other capabilities like arc boats has done a great job of encapsulating what the future of maritime looks like in that You know, from a process and team perspective, Mitch and Ryan uh, delivered the Tesla and SpaceX vision and mission uh, to Maritime. They're not just creating consumer boats that are electrified. They're actually building better boats that are more user friendly, they're more functional, uh, and they're way more uh, appealing to the average consumer. Um, But while they're doing that, they're also creating a manufacturing process that understands that the factory is the product and they're doing that in a way that scales beyond just their first arc one boat but allows them to eventually expand beyond to other product lines and i think all that together is quite important we're seeing plenty of additional like interesting developments on underwater imaging etc and a lot of the I, i guess like the final encapsulation point is just space ultimately had to be done a lot of things in-house and vertically integrated and we're seeing a similar approach with maritime right i mean arc is such a good example we talked to mitch semi-recently and i think i use the term copy and paste but you brought up a really good point which is that the aerospace industry got the ball rolling but we now need entrepreneurs to basically take that technology and specialize it for these different industries. He made a great point that a car will continue rolling down the street for a pretty long while, even if the engine isn't running, a boat will stop immediately, right? So each of these industries is unique. And so maybe you can speak to some of the different applications so folks can get a sense of what may be on the horizon. If we do incorporate these new innovations, what are the kind of geopolitical supply chain or climate applications that you are seeing built or that you see on the way? And maybe also how far are we in that trajectory? Like, are are these coming in a year, five years, 10 years? What can we expect? There's a lot of change happening and there's a dearth of problems to be solved. I think the good news is that we're seeing a ton of blue space here in terms of what can be done. And in some ways, we're quite early in this chapter, but in other ways, I mean, many of these companies are progressing quite rapidly and have been at it for a while. And so you're you're seeing some pretty profound changes, Um, you know, maybe on like the observability front. Something that's been really interesting is you have a problem that expands from deep water navigation and autonomy that starts with route optimization, emissions management, but it also ends up in your ports. And so one thing that was pretty mind blowing is that, you know, we're dealing with the majority of our trade in the U.S. is tied to the inland uh, navigable waterways. And you have a mix of ocean water and then sediment that's constantly changing the seafloor. Uh, And the current way that we navigate all of this is we manually every 100 feet um, try and measure this where the bottom of the seafloor is. Um, And as a result, it's changing and it's very inaccurate. Um, And this is something that Sonar um, and other pieces of technology historically have been great at solving. And now we're seeing companies with machine vision and other technologies that are uh, fastening this to the bottom of boats and are doing this in a synchronized manner and so that you're able to have a live map of where the seafloor is, how many ships can go down a specific port path, et cetera. So that's one. I think the other way to think about this is you're taking a lot of the raw analog instrumentation, you're digitizing that, similar to what Flexport has done with customs and freight forwarding and now financing. Um, and then you're also adding sensors, like I was mentioning, to v- existing vessels and infrastructure. And you're using all that data to capture and create uh, more interesting and efficient route optimizations. And then I think the final thing that's really been interesting is There's companies like Arc, but also Saronic, Anderol with their dive platform that are building new versions of vessels from the ground up 
with modern day assumptions on how should these vehicles operate in a digital world. Um, and as a result, we're seeing some pretty um, impressive development on just like hardware that re-envisions what something on the water should look like. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now you don't have to account for people on a boat. You can have something that lasts longer can go under the water, um, can focus on mission planning, et cetera. Yeah. And maybe one specific application uh, that you can speak to is just the idea of autonomous fleets, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that enable? Like you've mentioned in your big idea, the potential for mining or observation, what does the ability, and I know that the idea of autonomous fleets isn't necessarily net new in 2024, but what does that enable? Like, are there second, third order effects of having that autonomy, which we're also seeing increased on land, but instead in water in this case? Yeah, autonomy is interesting because there's so many applications and it's, as to your point, it's been discussed for many years. Uh, I think there's the reality is that there's going to be different waves of autonomy in maritime. Um, there's going to be the actual autonomy for deep water navigation, which frankly is probably less difficult than some of the other problems. Like once you're in a port, you're navigating against other vessels, against a shifting uh, tide and then also seafloor. Um, and then there's also ideas of like, can we ferry people from one port to another and actually make water transportation and navigation uh, much more efficient and uh, renew that in a way that most people right now don't. Um, and then I think more broadly on, on the defense side or even on like some more of the fringe cases, you know, the, the goal is to create vessels that can go where people can't. And so whether that's the sea floor um, and mining precious metals in areas where we can reduce our reliance on other countries for raw imports, or it's a patrolling our, our coasts um, covertly in our alleys and protecting them um, or just navigating other issues. A lot of this stuff is, is quite useful. Um, and we, to, to date, we've been quite limited based on where people can go. Uh, again, probably the Titan implosion is unfortunately a, a good example of just the reality that humans can't survive very well in, under uh, immense pressure in the water. Yeah, that was definitely an unfortunate uh, case. But speaking to that, there are going to be challenges, I imagine, along the way to some of the applications that you're describing. And you already spoke to how going deep underwater is just inherently hard, even when you're on the surface. It's just much more complex than being on land. So what are the key challenges that you expect on this path to modernizing maritime? I think like any industry that has a robust history, um, it's going to be difficult to change. And there's many things that are kind of tied together. There's structural challenges, there's technological ones, and then there's ultimately challenges with adoption and distribution when you're dealing with, you know, something in the physical world. Um, those are often the hardest things to tackle, and that's where friction is really high. Um, and I think for entrepreneurs, probably first and foremost, the most pressing thing is having a foundational understanding of how the maritime industry works and how your company fits into that picture. Oftentimes, you know, this means finding initial beachhead market and understanding how you can enter that market um, and then expand into a larger prize. And I think, you know, very similar to Amazon, you can't boil the whole ocean at once. You need to thread the needle and go from books to the everything store. And some of the best founders we've talked to in these categories um, have been able to articulate a very clear understanding of both how the broader ecosystem works and then how their company fits into it. On the technical side, you know, it's a double edged sword because a lot of the tech that we are talking about that can be ported over from other categories like aerospace can be brought over pretty readily. But at the same time, the reality that it's, it is functioning so well is because it is a quite difficult uh, category to build for. Um, and then probably most importantly is once you build it and you understand what you want to do, uh, you still have to sell this to customers. And this is a category that, you know, the people in the industry are quite smart, but it's very difficult to convince them to change because most of the stuff that you're trying to sell to them is dealing with mis mission critical applications. They can't have downtime um, and they're already dealing with huge backlogs and stresses. And so they oftentimes need to have proof of work. They need to be able to see that there's some sort of like verifiable evidence that what you're doing will save them money and time. 
And so as a result, there's just a, a huge onus on being able to deliver something rapidly in a cost efficient manner. Totally. And by the way, I have to say, I love your water analogies. You said you can't boil the ocean and also vast blue space. So I guess to close things off, um, there's a lot of opportunity here. That's clear. You see a lot of different companies attacking these kinds of problems. If you were an entrepreneur, and there's probably lots listening, I think you know this is the kind of idea that gets people up in their seats thinking, oh, wow, I can really build something real with my hands. We talked software and hardware coming together. What opportunities are you most excited about? And again, if you were an entrepreneur or builder, how would you even think about starting? I think to start, you know, understand that there's, again, to use these analogies and metaphors, like there's a vast blue space, space here. And as a result, you need to be really articulate and intentional about what you want to solve. Um, and you're going to be tempted to address plenty of other problems. And, and the reality is having focus here is going to be paramount to a successful company. Um, and then from there, you're going to earn the ability to operate and expand and do much more. I think another interesting idea that we've seen is that in categories that are really resistant to adopting software, oftentimes hardware is a great Trojan horse where you can sell that the customer base is used to purchasing some form of hardware. Um, and then from there, you're able to layer in software capabilities and use that as the wedge from which you can kind of expand. Um, but I, I think, you know, to carry on the autonomous via vessel and, and vehicle side of things, you know, we're seeing in defense and in many categories, there's an asymmetric advantage to having high volume and low cost. Mm -hmm. And so in, in this world of defense, but also just observability, you know, anticipate there's going to be a number of companies that are able to provide swarms of vessels, both on the surface and also subsurface that are able to not only protect our shores and our allies, but are able to detect um, environmental damage, uh, issues in our oceans, um, and ultimately able to help us probably observe, um, you know, our fisheries uh, and other supply chains much more effectively. All right, I hope you enjoyed this big idea. We do have a lot more on the way, including programmable medicine that's taking a page out of the reusable rocket playbook, anime going mainstream, and whether the consumer AI battleground may be moving from model to UX. Plus, if you wanna see our full list of 40 plus big ideas right now, you can head on over to a16z.com slash big ideas 2024. It's time to build.